I've been hearing a lot of good things about the latest Puss in Boots movie over the past few months. And recently I decided to give it a try. And I can't lie, I was pleasantly surprised by how good it was. It actually seemed like DreamWorks had gone to the good old days of Shrek and Kung Fu Panda. The movie is quite in your face with its deep philosophies and it didn't feel like I was watching a children's movie. And especially in this era of unoriginal movies, it was such a refreshing movie to get immersed into. But if there's one thing that stood out for me from this movie, the thing that made the movie so good was its antagonist. And no, I'm not talking about Big Jack Horner, I'm talking about the Big Bad Wolf, Death Incarnate. I have watched many animated films in my life and over the years, I've seen many great villains portraying the antagonist role to perfection. And I don't even think it's recency bias that's making me say this, but honestly, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like Death from Puss in Boots The Last Wish. So why is this menacing wolf the best antagonist I've ever seen in an animated film? Normally in movies, we get all sorts of villains. Villains who exist to be evil, villains that are influenced by evil, and villains who think they're doing the right thing while doing evil. We can frame this in many different ways, but every good movie needs a villain that shares some of these guidelines. The villain should have a connection to the hero, they should possess a clear morality, they should be a powerful and worthy adversary, they should have a compelling backstory, and they should mean something to you as much as it does for the protagonist. And I could name you countless villains who fit all these guidelines. But in this video, I want to separate the animated villains from the live action ones because these two mediums are vastly different. And making cross comparisons would be a weird task. So based on the set criteria, animated movies have produced some great villains over the years. Syndrome from The Incredibles, Scar from The Lion King, and arguably the best of the lot, Lord Shen from Kung Fu Panda 2 who easily shares some of the qualities of a perfect antagonist. But my personal favorite has always been Tai Lung from the first Kung Fu Panda. Although you could argue that Lord Shen was a better overall antagonist because he ticked more boxes, there was something about Tai Lung that made him unique. His connection to the protagonist wasn't personal but more of a professional one for his destiny was intertwined with Po. And on face value, one could see Tai Lung as a villain with flawed morals. But if you dive deeper, you'd see a tortured soul looking for approval. And in Tai Lung's backstory, we see the bond that he had with Shifu and how a broken promise led him to a path of evil and revenge. But with this hatred festering in his mind and an impending destiny, we see how formidable Tai Lung really is as he single-handedly breaks out of a prison that is solely built to contain just him. Tai Lung was the perfect villain to reveal the perfect dichotomy between him and Po. Although Po had nothing personal with Tai Lung, he had to defeat Tai Lung to open his eyes, to show him that greed was never the answer. And for the longest time, Tai Lung had been my favorite animated villain. But that was until this happened. Okay, where do I even begin with this one? Death is an enigma to say the least. And I think it's fair to say that it is actually quite unusual for a western animated film to have a hard-hitting villain like Death. I've seen similar portrayals of villains in shows like Full Metal Alchemist where you have personified villains of abstract emotions. But anime is kind of like the wild west. In eastern animation, anything goes. And whenever you see something like this, it's not necessarily something that raises a few eyebrows. It is not the exception, but the rule. But like I said, in western animation, or more specifically, in animated feature films, it's actually very unlikely that you'd find villains that are hard to process. Because most of them follow the general formula that I mentioned above. Which indeed makes them very good antagonists. And sure enough, this is a working formula. And you don't have to fix it if it isn't broken. But the thing that made me gravitate towards anime in recent times is the fact that they break free from any guidelines or parameters set for a certain genre. It's almost like every anime has its own rules. And as long as you stick to that set of rules, the abstract characters they portray works beautifully. And the more I thought about Puss in Boots The Last Wish, the more I realized that it almost functions like an anime. Its main antagonist isn't someone who wants to take over the world or seek revenge. No, it's plain and simply death. I'm deaf, straight up. 
This scene was so deep and meaningful that it gave me chills. Which is why I personally don't even think that it's a children's movie. Seriously, when you're talking about a villain whose sole purpose is just to take your life away without wanting anything materialistic instead, it ain't no children's movie we're dealing with here. There are levels to animated movie villains and death is easily the final boss. You see, death isn't any ordinary villain. This is the incarnation of the very concept that exists in every living thing imaginable. The fear of death. Perhaps the most intrinsic fear that exists. I stated before that Tai Lung was my favorite animated villain. He was formidable, he was menacing, he had a compelling backstory and his morals, although flawed, were justified as he was merely looking for his mentor's approval. And the movie built up his reveal to be one of the best I had seen at that time. But when you try to apply this to death from Puss in Boots 2, you can almost see how incredibly difficult it gets to quantify this antagonist. Death is unimaginably formidable because you simply can't beat death. And there is no single soul in this world that wouldn't fear death, for it is the final boss in everyone's chapter, making it the most menacing thing that you could possibly think of. Death doesn't need a backstory for it is the personification of a looming fear. And obviously, death doesn't need morals for it is the great equalizer and in time, it comes for us all. And this lack of materialism is what makes this wolf terrifying. It's like that quote from The Dark Knight. Some men aren't looking for anything logical, like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. This was quoted by Alfred in reference to the Joker. Although the Joker was human, from bone to flesh, he stood for something beyond materialism. He was a beacon of chaos, and such villains are notoriously difficult to defeat. And like I said before, comparing animated villains to live action ones is very hard because you can only do so much with animation in terms of conveying expressions and feelings. But if there's one thing that's universal with every antagonist, regardless of which medium they are portrayed in, it is the weight of the concept which the villain represents. And in terms of concept, there is a great deal of overlap between death and the Joker. Not in the most explicit way, but rather in reference to this very quote that made the Joker who he was. Much like the Joker, death isn't looking for anything logical like money or materialism. Death in and of itself is an inescapable destiny. And there was nothing Puss in Boots could do to negotiate with death. He was there for him and the only way he could postpone the inevitable was to meet death head on and just hope that he changes his mind. The sheer weight of this idea hits hard and I don't think you could look at it any differently. This was actually death. Straight up. But any discussion of this character wouldn't be complete without the way he is introduced in the movie. A few moments ago, I talked about how Tai Lung's introduction in Kung Fu Panda was one of the best animated intros ever. But after watching this movie, I can't lie, but this intro, for this villain specifically, is one of the most profound ways you can introduce a larger-than-life character. Just notice how simple and effective this one shot is. All his life, Puss in Boots has known one thing and one thing only, and that is to be a hero. His legacy was what he lived for, and there was nothing more he ever wanted from his nine lives. And throughout all the iterations of Puss in Boots, we never see him doubt himself. The legend always lived on in his mind. But this scene changes that. The doctor puts a question in his mind that he ruminates over, which leads to this scene, where there is a visible worry in his words. He doesn't want to believe that he is on his last life, for it meant that he could actually die and not come back. Now this is where this scene gets deeper. When Puss in Boots starts to doubt himself, the tavern slowly turns quiet, and dare I say, deathly quiet. Then the camera seemingly pans out and shows Puss in Boots from above, as if someone was watching him from above. And this vulnerability is showcased further by how his back is turned against the screen, oblivious to someone or something. And then, the only remaining candle left on the chandelier dies out, as Puss in Boots looks one last time in the mirror to question himself, but he convinces himself that he's too good to retire. In other words, too good to die. And that's when you hear this. And not long after you hear this, 
do you see the most simplistic yet profound introductions to any character in animation? The arrival of the cloaked white wolf is symbolic of how death is in real life. You don't ever see it coming, but yet you know that it is coming. It is a phantom that is always behind you, almost like a shadow. And this scene symbolizes everything about the concept of death. No one ever is ready to meet death. Just like Puss in Boots is here in this scenario, where he simply doesn't understand what he's dealing with. His ego and his legacy had made him blind towards fear, and it took him on a path to encounter the Grim Reaper himself. The White Wolf, cloaked in black. I could go on and on about how menacing the sound of this whistle is, but I think the whole scene in this tavern is crafted to perfection, as it shows you the gravity of the situation and the weight of the villain that we're dealing with. And this very scene is where you actually start to fear for yourself and for the protagonist, as the wolf shows how formidable he is, for he is a mere representation of an inescapable concept. And for the first time in his life, Puss in Boots is outclassed by his adversary as he draws blood. And the look on Puss in Boots' face is now not just a mere concern, but it is a genuine fear of death. And for me, this is where the white wolf turns into the perfect antagonist. For this scene raises the question, how does Puss in Boots beat death? And dare I say, it only takes two minutes for death to become the best animated villain I have ever seen. I hate to keep making comparisons between animation and live action, but this pub scene from Puss in Boots The Last Wish, it actually reminded me of a very similar scene from the fifth season of Supernatural from an episode called Two Minutes to Midnight. In this episode, we see a personified version of death, just like in Puss in Boots The Last Wish. And the show does an excellent job of conveying the weight of this character. There is an element of anticipation given to every little thing he does. And more specifically, his introduction is one of the best introductions to any antagonist you'll ever see. And then we arrive at this scene. I want you to notice the similarities between these two scenes. For a bit of context, this is Dean Winchester, one of the protagonists of the show. And if you know anything about him, you know that this guy kills angels, demons and even gods for a living. He isn't afraid of anything. But that's until this happens. Life, death, chicken, egg. Regardless, at the end, I'll reap him too. God? You'll reap God? Oh yes. God will die too, Dean. Notice the sheer look of concern on Dean's face when he realizes that this isn't any ordinary adversary. He goes into the diner wanting to kill death, but realizes very soon that it might not just be possible. And this is the similar expression of concern that you'll see on the face of Pussin Boots as well, when he realizes that he had underestimated the adversary. The setup is in the introduction and if it's done properly, you got yourself a villain that people would genuinely worry about. This introduction leaves a mark and every single time we hear this whistle, we know that there is no escaping this entity. The wolf is hunting and haunting at the same time. And in the scenes that follow, the intimidation factor goes up a notch. And in this very scene, death lives up to his name as he delivers one of the best lines I've heard in recent times. He's in every way, shape or form, the personification of death. And for a villain, it doesn't get better than that. I feel like I've been using the terms antagonist and villain synonymously all this time. But although they're the same most of the time, they're not necessarily the same thing all the time. Antagonists are more related to the plot as they are plot devices, whereas villains on the other hand are just evil characters. An antagonist of a movie doesn't always have to be the villain, such as in Harry Potter where Severus Snape or even Draco Malfoy becomes the perfect antagonist. You never see these characters as true villains, at least not to the extent of Voldemort. Although the title of this video suggests that Death is the best animated villain I have ever seen, I don't necessarily consider him as a true villain, for he's more of an antagonist in this movie that drives the plot forward. It is literally the fear of death that drives Puss in Boots to find the wishing star. And I believe that this makes the personification of death all the more perfect. Death was merely there to challenge the ego that the protagonist carried. He was the obstacle that made Puss in Boots question his life choices. Death was never portrayed as an evil entity with malicious intentions. 
He was there to teach an arrogant hero a lesson in humility and to value his life, for it doesn't matter how many you got unless you spend it with the people you care for. And when death walks away, there is no winner here. There's only a lesson well learned and a postponed destiny. And if anything, the protagonist and the antagonist have nothing but respect for each other when they part ways. And I don't have to tell you twice that this isn't normal in movies. The villain almost always gets the sticky ending which they probably deserved. But when the antagonist walks away, having taught the protagonist more lessons than the other way around, it's plain and simple, we're dealing with a unique situation here. And although these kinds of statements are difficult to make and are largely subjective, for me personally, I don't think I've ever seen a better animated villain than the cloaked white wolf from Puss in Boots The Last Wish. He is indeed the best animated villain I've ever seen. Straight up.